Uh, so we're, we're going to get started. Um, I am so sorry about the delay. We have this situation with the room, room booking. Uh, but we're good now. So uh, let's get started. So as always, I'm going to start off with the announcements um, for today. Oh, that is not the right. OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I just wanted to give you an, an update. So we had uh, the Pico CTF together. It was great. We had about like 20 to 22 people show up. Um, it was very casual. Um, it was, I think, like a pretty successful event. We're going to hopefully do that more often. If you don't know, again, what a CTF is, a CTF is just like a competition that's very popular in this industry. And if you're in first year and you've never participated in one before, um, I would definitely recommend going through the Pico CTF again. Um, the challenges are posted year round. You can even go to last year's challenges. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, died on some questions, though, even though it's meant to be like for high school. So, so there were some like RSA questions. Apparently, high schoolers can do RSA these days. So that's, anyway. Um, announcement number one, which is our regular announcement. You should definitely do a talk. Um, you can do a talk about anything that you want, as long as it's security related. Um, if you bring something new to the table, if you've written some piece of software, if you just want to talk about like, an industry trend, we would love for you to do that. Um, you can contact any of the people that are up there. I'm Lue, uh, Pumpkin Steffi Adams, our event manager, and Rick is the lovely professor. Um, we're also looking for speakers for November 1st and November 15th. 15th, right? Um, so if you're interested, uh, please let me know. You can, again, message any of the people there. Um, you should go to the conferences that are happening this week. So B-Sides, I believe, is sold out. So if you haven't gotten your ticket, I'm sorry. But Sector, they have a ton of space. So I would definitely recommend going to Sector. Um, there's going to be like, a, so there's like a free ticket, and then there's a paid ticket. And the free ticket actually gets you access to a lot of things, like the general area. There's a whole bunch of booths set up. Um, it's a good experience. Um, yeah, so free so socks. Free socks? Free socks. Free talks, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Not free socks. Well, That's maybe right. Free socks, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe free socks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, swag. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some humble bundles to consider. I'm going to keep doing this regularly just because like, I think it's good. I think the resources that I find, I think it's kind of helpful to me. I talked about the Python one last time, if you were here. Uh, I actually went through some of the videos in it. It has videos, and they're really great. So if you're not like a person who can sit down or read a textbook, Videos are, are really, really good. There's like asynchronous Python and stuff like that. Um, uh, or sorry, multi-threading Python. And then uh, we've got a Linux and Unix uh, book bundle right now. So if you want like a whole book, like 300 pages about how Grep works and just Grep, um, you, can, you can go and read that book. Uh, but just so you know, it exists. It's there. 20 bucks. Um, and so, yeah, that's it for the announcements. And now I'm going to pass it off to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, one, yeah, one more so thing that Adam wanted to mention. Size, yeah. For those going, um, I don't have my phone. There's a train. If you guys want to meet up uh, to go to B-Sides, in case, like, just as a group, um, there's, a, there's a train that's going to arrive at Union at 8.10. So if you guys are heading down there, uh, we'll be, I'll be on the first, uh, first train. Um, no, first, first. Do you know cart? Cart. cart. I'll be on the first cart. First uh, cart. So if you guys want to meet up with some of yeah, your students, then eight ten uh, first cart. Yeah. Make friends. We don't bite. Yep. We're friendly people. Um, okay. Um, the one heading towards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if you really like walking, you can try, you can start from the back and just work your way up, work your way down. And what what room? What what time was the train again? Uh, it arrives at Union at 8.10. Alright. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully you're gonna have to see, wake you'll up feel the seat tomorrow. <laughs> Alright. Okay, and, uh, sorry, once again, to the news roundup with Nick and Adam. Yep. News, news, news. Cool. Okay, so, um, I didn't tell Adam this. I put the stories that I looked up first so that I can talk a lot at the beginning and then think about what I'm going to talk about for the repo part while he talks more at the second half. Oh, surprise. Um, so uh, there was a great big Android uh, OJ that got released in sometime in the last two weeks. Oh, sweet. We have a countdown now. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and it affects like a metric butt ton of models of Android phones except like a couple like random versions of like the Pixel 3 and stuff like that. Um, 
basically what it is, it appears to, I, don't, I didn't see like the full detail of the exploit, but what it appears to be is something in, uh, as part of like the Chrome engine or the Chromium engine underneath that is really tightly integrated into the Android OS that would allow someone to elevate to administrator level privileges if they can pull off this exploit. There's two versions of it. One um, would be like devastating if you installed an untrusted app. To do that though, you have to change a whole bunch of settings on your phone. That's the less concerning one. The other one is you could be impacted just by visiting a website with a malicious payload in it. The good part though is to make that one work. It requires the help of a second exploit in Chrome's like rendering engine. So that part isn't necessarily there, but the first part is. Um, it just sucks because it targets like a bajillion devices. Um, so how far back does it go, or how, uh, which operating systems are affected the newest one? Uh, no, like even older versions of Android and newer okay. versions, it's, yeah. So, yep, that's the thing. Uh, moving on. There's a lot of vari variants of WannaCry out there. WannaCry being the like uh, eternal blue power driven malware, meaning it spreads itself via like Windows sharing, the old version of Windows sharing. Um, and then it deploys ransomware on people's stuff. It was the one that hit the national housing or national hospital service in the UK a couple of years ago. And it just deploys ransomware, locks stuff down, you unlock it when you pay ransoms. It's just, it sucks that there's so many variants out there um, because groups have figured out, hey, this is a sweet way of making money. And Sophos has been able to ID lots of, basically when they say variant, like someone's made a little change to it. Maybe the exploits work a little better. Maybe they've made a change to the ransomware engine that's being used, something like that. It's probably just always the yeah, yeah. Someone's just like changing the Bitcoin address, and that's it, or Monero, or whatever it it makes. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> awesome. One of two stories about the Turla hacking group, who are insane. Uh, rumor has it they're basically like a Russian-sponsored uh, attack group, or at least that's what most people think. Anyways, um, talk about like using servers that are really hard to shut down. They've been routing their command and control traffic for malware through satellites. So good luck taking that server down if you find out that it's them running some malware command and control server. That's kind of awesome. They're bad, they're like bad people, they do bad things, but it's kind of cool to like run all your attacks through satellite infrastructure because it's not like someone can go and unplug your satellite, so yeah. Do you think they're preparing for the uh, Black Hat's uh, satellite CTF? Yeah, it could be. <laughs> like they're just getting a head start on the contest for next yeah, year. Exactly. Yeah, there's a, I think we talked about that last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was um, last week. Where, two weeks ago. Uh, where you could hack a satellite from. Yeah, um, last I said. Also, that group is in the news for another thing that they got found out doing a couple of days ago, which is they're like attacking people's computers and they're putting like a malicious software patch over top of Chrome or Firefox. Um, and the only thing they're changing is the way it announces what kind of crypto it supports when it visits websites. The idea is they've embedded like a little extra flag that will tell websites kind of, it will uniquely identify the user who's browsing the, the web that has this patched version of Chrome or Firefox. And that's not great because oftentimes people use a lot of the features in Firefox and lots of the plugins to enhance their privacy and stuff like that. So if you've got a version of Firefox that's been patched maliciously to sort of de-anonymize you, that's not great. Again, because rumor has it that this group works for the Russian government, maybe it's to help them ID people that they don't like. Um, there are details over how it modifies some of the crypto stuff. But honestly, it's like 7.20 on a Friday night and I don't want to talk about math. So <laughs> I'm move along. Um, this one got announced like, I don't know, I, it, the tweet happened there, but I think it only got announced like publicly very recently. Uh, Google's Project Zero, who is that Google group that like hacks things and comes up with exploits and tells companies to fix it, found an issue in the messaging app Signal which is crazy, it's a thing that can basically force the phone to answer a call. Um, the exploit works by, they call you, and while the call is like still ringing, basically, um, with like a malicious program, they can force it to pick up the call. They can say, oh yeah, we've already connected, the ringing shouldn't be happening anymore. And Natalie Silvanovich, who's the, one of the ones that kind of uh, found the vulnerability. She said, if you get the timing right, you can actually get the phone to pick up before the person even hears the first ring, oh, wow. which is crazy. Um, apparently, Signal's patched it, though, which is great. Um, so, yeah, wild. The, uh, iPhone 
Yeah, the FaceTime. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. It's just like the FaceTime thing from uh, what was that in the around Christmas time or something like that, or like late last summer, year. Summer, I think. Was it the summer? Yeah. Summer, yeah. Where FaceTime would do the same thing. FaceTime would answer a call that was placed maliciously. So kind of cool. Oh yes, DoorDash. So basically, um, hackers have gained access to about five million customer accounts uh, a while a little bit back on April fifth. And basically, what they compromised was was uh, the physical address of uh, customers, order histories, phone numbers, uh, hash insulted passwords, so not plain text, which is pretty good. Um, and also for some customers, the last four digits of their credit card. Um, and also for some of their drivers, they compromised like uh, 100,000 uh, driver's licenses. Uh, DoorDash became aware of the unusual activity by a third party. And, th and so they hired a third party to deal with the incident as well. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of nice. They uh, said that they would, will notify uh, people, they'll, they'll notify those affected. Uh, and they said that they're gonna improve their security program. Good, so, yeah. Because I don't want people knowing what kind of dirty food I eat <laughs> like, all the time. At like totally. two in the morning? Yeah, totally. It's always Taco Bell, yes. just so everyone knows. Okay. Always Taco Bell. Um, yes, so there is, um, so a lot of, like thousands of PCs have been affected. There's a Node.js framework, so that's a JavaScript, uh, popular JavaScript framework, and it uses uh, WinDivert uh, packet capture. So basically, <coughs> I believe they sort of alluded to it, it kind of runs in memory, as I understand. So um, if, for example, you reboot your machine, then you're, uh, you remove the malware. Um, and it turns reverse proxies and uh, it turns infected computers into uh, proxies for malicious behavior. So they're just using it to proxy their connections for other for like malicious stuff that they're doing. Um, and they deliver it through user downloading malware through their br browser or browsing through a malicious ad. And so it seems to be quite successful on that front. Also, if we scroll up and down, it looks like the like little face tentacles are wiggling, which is just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. So also, so Microsoft uh, added a bunch of fi malicious files, uh, files that are commonly malicious to um, Outlook on the web. So there's like 142 file extensions. There, probably if your if your corporation is running Outlook, they'll probably have these uh, these uh, disabled anyways, like PS1 files, so PowerShell files, um, I believe, Python, so Pi, and a couple other stuff, or like, <coughs> so if you try sending like a file through email, it'll be blocked. And they're adding that functionality to the web, which is kind of nice, so. That's a lot of file extensions. That's gonna make a lot of pen testers have a bad day. Yeah, um, until definitely. you zip it, and then you're like, oh, yeah. I can send it. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, um, oh yes, so basically there's a, uh, instead of, so there's been a growing market of uh, malware that's being sold. So a malware developer will write it and then try selling it to the dark market. Usually they'll sell it for a couple thousand dollars or so. This time around, um, they're just selling it for like nine dollars and it's like a .NET package and, so, and they're, Perfect. They're kind of advertising it as like a low skilled for adversaries like that kind of want to get into like uh, pen test, uh, not pen testing, like doing malicious things. So it's supposed to be like low skill. Comes with a cool GUI dashboard and like supports Telegram, or sorry, you get a, a su support via Telegram, so like a secure messaging platform. So yeah, it's kind of. That's neat. I like that it's nine dollars. What like a yeah? A, it's like super cheap. It's nice for like an entry price point in the yeah. malware market. Like yo, yeah. our stuff's nine bucks, and it will steal you crypto wallets. I wonder how many antivirus software companies are just like give us nine dollars, <laughs> buy it, <they> get a <laughs> signature, and get their own free signature. Yeah, totally. <laughs> right. Maybe. Oh man. Oh yes. Oh, this is a this is a weird one. Um. So basically, my pair, uh, my payroll HR. Basically, the CEO tried doing like uh, bank allegedly tried doing bank fraud, um, where he basically, what happens is the company, uh, their clients will send, will transfer money to bank account, and then my HR will send it to, uh, send pay, people's payroll to, to uh, direct deposit to, to other people's bank account to pay them. 
and the CEO decided to uh, redirect where the funds go. So instead of uh, the payroll being sent to all the employees, he just gets it sent to his bank account. Um, and he did some other stuff where like he could do like, um, I think this goes uh, quite way back, uh, a little bit way back, uh, where you'd have a check and then, I'll see if I can explain it. Check we'll credit? Yeah, you have a check uh, to uh, for amount of money that you don't have in your in another person's bank account. So you enter, you give, you deposit that money into your bank account, and before they can validate that the money is actually in that uh, bank account, you uh, withdraw the money, or in this case, you transferred it back and forth. So he just kept accumulating money in that way. So yeah, they finally caught him, um, and yeah, so that's amazing. Yeah, it, like it's not. It wasn't very like out there, but like it's like really. It's still yeah. interesting. Yeah. Are yeah. Lawyers out of the money in place? That would probably be yeah. insured, I bet. Yeah. So um, I believe like the company like when when their clients started complaining, they're like, "Hey, why are people not getting paid?" They're like, "Just we're having some downtime, <laughs> so just like figure it out." <laughs> so yeah, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, which one is this? Thanks, TikTok. So, uh, UK. Oh, yes. So, yeah. you want to start? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so, when cops bust, you know, rings of bad guys and cyber criminals and stuff, they often seize all their assets and usually they liquidate them. In certain countries and in certain jurisdictions, the, um, the agency that liquidates the bad guy assets, meaning sells them off, gets the money to improve their own internal uh, infrastructure and stuff. So, basically, they're saying by selling off a bunch of crypto coin from a hacking group, um, that UK police department made themselves um, a big load of cash. Which, yep. What's that, like half a million dollars or something like that? Depending on where yeah. the pound is at, mm -hmm. based on what's going on in England right now? I don't know. They're like, we validated the people that, that are buying, are bidding on this. So, yep. yeah, it's kind of interesting. So, this is kind of the first time that the UK has done this. Mm -hmm. um, and they see this through hackers yep. that they caught. Uh, Senate. Yes. Okay. So the Senate passes bill aimed at combating ransomware attacks. So basically there's new legislation that has been approved uh, by the US Senate called D DHS uh, Cyber Hunt and Incident Response Act. So it's aimed at, aimed at protecting local cities and school because local cities and schools and hospitals have been heavily targeted by ransomware. Um, and so this bill tries to kind of uh, cut down on that. So basically it authorizes the Department of Homeland Security to create an IR team, so an incident response team, to help private businesses and government organizations. So kind of a step in the right, I think it's a step in the right direction because if, if a company or a government body has been has been hacked, like usually a government body has doesn't have the IT infrastructure, uh, sorry, the manpower mm -hmm. uh, to deal with it. So uh, we covered a story where, where there was a similar situation and basically, um, their mandate is that there's to protect and uh, restore infrastructure by ransomware, and also, which is interestingly, proactively mitigate against cyber threats and identify cybersecurity risk, um, and like develop migration strategies and provide guidance. So, kind of be a bit more open, giving some some free advice. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, Dunkin' Donut. No. Okay, yeah, so this is kind of interesting. So it, here in, I believe it's Canada, we have the mandatory breach notification. Yep. Yep, okay, I get Got Nick's, Nick's out of, yep. approval, of <laughs> approval. Passed in November. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of similar to what, uh, so New York has a similar law where if a customer gets, uh, um, customer's information is suspected to or does get compromised in a breach, the company has to notify uh, the consumer um, of the breach, and in this case, the attorney uh, general sued um, Dunkin' Donuts or uh, like a subsidiary government. Like it's basically Dunkin' Donuts for um, for not uh, notifying customers soon enough. So this is kind of interesting because like we see we see that the government's kind of taking this seriously. So there's more precedents like to kind of have good notifications and a plan in place because many organizations don't. So, so, like, don't ignore your breach reporting requirements? <laughs> <laughs> yes. New York specifically, it sounds like that because each state kind of has their own notification. Uh, yes. Yeah. It might have been because Dunkin' Donuts didn't know that New York had a shorter time frame to 
than California yeah. does. Yeah, yeah, it could be. They have to hire new lawyers. Like, yeah. and lawyers that's, write the law, so that's you know. a little tricky. Yep. Oh, this was crazy. Yeah. Yes, yes. It. So um, basically, there's an unfixable iOS device exploit um, that basically they're saying is one of the largest Android Apple security upheavals. So basically, it affects all phone, all iPhones between 2011 and 2017. Uh, can now be easily jailbroken. Uh, recently, like over time, jailbreaking has become less and less common. It's become ha uh, much harder to do so as Apple has been locking down the OS uh, more and more. And basically, the researcher Ax Axion X check me. Yeah. Or is it yeah. this guy? Um, oh, you don't have it. I can't. See. Yeah, there you go. Check. So basically, um, he. Uh, Wrote wrote a piece of a proof of concept called Checkmate at, at uh, Check Check M8. It's available on GitHub. Uh, it relies on a flaw in the boot ROM, so that uh, Apple can't patch it because it's so low level. It's the boot ROM is the for one of the first uh, pieces of code to execute when a boot it, when uh, iPhone is booting, so they can't easily easily um, update it depending on depending on how it is like. Uh, um, and uh, because ROM stands for read-only memory, uh, and basically how he found that discovered this was by reverse reverse engineering a patch um, that Apple issued in 2008. That's why it only affects devices up to 2017 because Apple fixed it. Uh, and it, the thing is, it's not gonna like you're not gonna see like mass exploitation of this. It requires a physical access to the machine, and it's only an, an in-memory exploit. So if you reboot the machine, the exploit is gone. Um, so uh, there's that. So it'll be mostly used for like, uh, like probably c policing or, or something like, and like, like very adva more advanced. Yeah, what it can't do is get access into stuff like that Apple Secure Enclave. So like the, some of the hardened data in there they can't get to. It d will allow someone to install, for example, older versions of iOS on newer hardware or newer versions of iOS on older hardware, which you basically have have to have like jailbroken and low level access mm -hmm. to the device to be able to do. So it does do that. Um, so it's cool from like a modding and hacking scene like that, but on newer iOS diverse, uh, devices, the security impact is pretty minimal. But if you can download a later version of, I of iOS, then you, you'd be more likely to have an exploit. Yeah. So then it makes, th makes your life a little bit easier. And it affects not only iPhones, uh, iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, iPod Touch, and Apple TV. Basically. So <laughs> a whole slew of, I of Everything running iOS. bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but iPad OS is different now. Oh, okay. And yeah. Apple TV OS is sort of different too. Why would they do it's that? It's like a four so. so. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so basically, uh, this article uh, is just kind of some statistics. So. Can we talk uh, about this picture for a second, though? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's great. I saw that. I was like, I got to read this. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so basically, um, they. Uh, um, I believe it was Carbon Black. Yeah, Carbon Black Research Report. So they interview, they um, uh, survey 250 senior leaders, so CTO, CSO, and CIO. Um, and about 80 85% admitted to some sort of breach uh, this last year. Um, one third suffered reputational damage. One fourth suffered financial damage. 27% uh, um, had. Uh, 27% of the breaches was a result of just generic malware, so very small. So as we see, like the trend towards um, like antivirus becoming less effective, like that trend is continuing. 93% uh, said that they're increasing their secure their infosec budget. So um, yeah, and phishing is still their still their primary point of entry. So train your users and yeah, just like. Email is hard sometimes, right? Nice. Can you do this one in 40 seconds? Oh, boy. OK, um, basically, Armis, which is an enterprise security forum, received a report. Uh, OK, so basically, there was an old IoT device that um, there was a flaw like that was already known. But it turns out that the, the vendor that wrote the OS, um, just it was a, another company that wrote the, the network stack, and they just sold it to a bunch of other companies. Uh, that wrote OSs, and so it turns out that um, that like a bunch of devices are vulnerable because they all use the same package, and that vendor has been long gone out of business. Like it got sold, and then it went out of business and stuff. So 
He's like medical devices. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Like medical pumps. That's always great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's all. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's all like medical devices and whatnot. So basically, the moral of the story: nothing ever dies. Yeah. Yeah. So everything is built off of old stuff. We just improve it, or maybe we're supposed to. Yeah. Except for Windows. Except for maybe those people attached to those medical devices. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah. 40 seconds on the dot. Pretty close. Yeah, good job. Thanks. Okay. That's uh, a new segment. Nice. We got through everything. We did. Good job. Thanks. What do we do next? Do oh, yeah. Oh, we, we have a schedule, I think. Do we? What's next? Um, Is it we have next, next repo round. Oh, okay. Great. Sweet. I can yes. do my thing? Yes, Sweet. you can. All right. Hi. Um, let's talk about code. So... Uh, anybody that was in my class like two hours ago saw me urgently scraping through my GitHub repos trying to figure out what we're going to talk about this time. Um, okay, sweet. Uh, so um, I think it, it must have been sometime earlier this year or in 2018 we talked about a super cool project that a bunch of students did um, out of University of France, because I don't remember. Um, they wrote this super awesome tool called UnCAPTCHA which basically took um, you know Google's reCAPTCHA thing where you either got to click pictures in an image or type what characters you see? Well, to make it accessible, it would also offer the option of listening to an audio file and typing in what numbers you heard. And they got written up and publicized a lot because they thought, what if we record that and actually feed it back into Google's own sound to text engine and see if Google can beat its own thing? And it did with like 85% accuracy. So I thought, I actually want to see how this code works. So I dug into that. So basically their, their tagline was defeating Google's audio recapture system with 85% accuracy. Again, that claim was in 2017 though. And the authors even say in their paper, um, since then, Google has done, taken additional steps to make the audio more difficult to decode to try to fool AI systems that are trying to actually decode it. But whatever, I still want to know how this works because it sounds awesome. Um, why would you want to trick an audio recaptcha or any kind of captcha tool? Basically so that you can write bots that create accounts and start doing stuff. Um, websites spend a lot of time and energy trying to prevent the creation of automated bot accounts for good reasons. Okay. Um, so with reCAPTCHA, like I said, one of the things that it would do is um, you know, play you an audio challenge and you just listen and there would be like six or seven or eight like numbers that you would type. Um, the thing that makes it tricky for AI is that the numbers would be read at different speeds and pitches and tones and stuff and that's hard for a computer to figure out, easy for a person. Um, in, in like five quick steps, how does their thing work? First off, they try to make it look like a bot. So they use automated web browsing software like Selenium that goes on Reddit and it tries to make an account on Reddit doing really sketchy bot looking stuff. Um, and at that point, Reddit's like, yo, and it throws up the reCAPTCHA, which is um, populated and fed to them by Google. Uh, at that point, they parse the web page, try to find out where the audio, the link to the audio challenge is, and then they download the audio challenge. Then what they do is split the audio challenge into what they think are the distinct numbers being read out. They think they find that basically by looking for gaps of silence in between the numbers. So imagine, you know, I said one, two, three. They would split on those gaps where I didn't make a sound and each one of those would become its own little MP3 file. And then they sent each individual MP3 off to a different web service like Google's own um, speech to text API to try to get back at least what is that one number in that one little file. Um, they used a whole bunch of different services like IBM's, Google's, um, Sphinx, and Bing, um, and a couple that I've never heard of. And they would basically take the results from all of those different services and kind of try to rank them. Like, oh, you know, four of these six services all reported that this number was the number two. So it's a pretty good chance it's the number two, right? Um, and they had a couple of other tricks that they would use to try to um, narrow that down and have like a priority and a ranking. And then they would feed the number back into the system and hopefully it worked. So, a um, bit of code. It's basically like two Python files and a bunch of third-party libraries they used. So there's main, uh, which imports Selenium, which is basically a program that can allow you to automate web browser activity. That's like a third-party library. It works really well. It's cool. So what they do is they fake some parameters to make it look like an instance of Google Chrome. Um, and then it goes to Reddit and it basically loads the Reddit homepage. It looks for the link that says registration form and it goes and it loads that page. 
Once it loads the registration form, it searches that for the tags that represent the area where the Google reCAPTCHA HTML code would be, so it finds that. It simulates clicking on requesting a reCAPTCHA, basically audio challenge. At that point, the page will be populated by the reCAPTCHA challenge. It starts out though with just the image one. They don't want the image, they want the audio file. So then what they do is if they're parsing for the audio file, they'll look for a button that says reCAPTCHA audio, and then they'll simulate a click on that, which will then provide them with a URL that they parse for. They happen to know the name of the URL is audio challenge t download whatever link. And then they just use the URL lib, lib library that we talked about in the last code rundown to go and fetch and download that MP3. So basically, open Reddit, find the reg form, tell it I want to do the reCAPTCHA, say I want the audio challenge version, simulate a bunch of clicks, and then bam, they have the MP3. So that's like part one, they have the MP3. Then they basically pass that to some function called get numbers, which is often something else. By the way, while I was here, I love the name of these two functions, type like bot and type like human. So they have to, when they want to force trigger the CAPTCHA, they have to write code that makes it look like it's a bot typing versus when they want to make it look like it's a human typing, they just make it a little bit more random and inconsistent versus the bot where the typing keystrokes are very consistent. That looks like a bot. I love that they just have type like bot, type like human. It's cute. Anyways, um, back to it. So we go off and we tell this function that, yo, I have a bunch of audio files, or I have one big long audio file. So first they gotta convert it from an MP3 to a WAV. Don't worry about trying to read the individual lines, I'm just giving you a rundown. So they convert it into a WAV file. Then they use a command line tool in Linux called SOX. SOX is good at detecting um, different types of properties in audio files, and that's what they use to split it into different files based on where they think the silence gaps are. Then they ditch everything else that they also think is silence by looking at how loud the sound is, and they have like a threshold that they compare that against. Then if it's a really loud sound, they ditch it, okay? Then all of those remaining sound clips that are probably numbers, they feed into some audio library that they wrote. In the audio library, they identify the different APIs that they want to use, like Google Cloud and Bing and IBM and stuff like that. Also, a couple of neat just facts. If you can't figure out what a number is, six. <laughs> Maybe it turned out that that was statistically the least likely number uh, for the AI or for the sound capture to figure out. So maybe they did some trials and figured if the AIs can't figure it out, it's probably a six, which is interesting. Then like, there's a big long if statement where they try to list homophones for the sounds for like one and two. So you can see they have two, 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 um, based on what the, um, the APIs and the AIs return. If they return any of these in text form, they're going to assume it's number two. Um, they do this and they actually go a couple of levels deep. Like these, they consider really close matches. They also have stuff that are like kind of matches, like three if they're looking for. It could also be Siri and B. So if the APIs return things like that, they're just going to map it to a three. They can do that because they know that the only sounds they should be getting back are, are the words zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right? Um, there's some words in here that, sorry. Um, anyways, uh, so they take the list of individual audio files and they split them up into little tasks or jobs and they do some parallel processing on this. So they split them all up and send each one to getNum. GetNum is basically where they fire up all the APIs and they send like the first number in their sequence to all of the APIs and they wait until they've all responded and they collect all the statistics on what they think that number is. Then they do it for the next number and the next number. And I, but it's all like multi-threaded, multi-process, so it happens really quickly and it pushes calls out to all these APIs. What does a call to one of them look like? Well, here's the call to Google Cloud. Here's all of their like API information, like they have to provide a password because they would have had to have signed up for an account on the Google Cloud API. So that's most of the request, but then down here is where they actually pass in the little audio file. They're also, what's kind of cool about the Google engine, they can say, here are the preferred words that we're looking for in this audio stream. We think it's one of these words. So it's almost like they're helping the AI along a little bit and they just provide the words 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And Google will basically return a little array with numbers that it thinks that it is, or words that it thinks that that string is. So they do this for all of those different engines like Bing and IBM and Google and stuff like that. Um, so when they get the results back, they t do a bunch of tabulation based on these things that I showed you earlier. 
Um, and then based on that, they have their most probable guess, and that's where they use that type like bot or type like human to type the correct answer into the response box on the Reddit registration page. Then they simulate clicking the submit button, and then basically they search the page looking for like the check mark that says that it was successful. If they find the check mark, then they know that they've created the account. If they can't find the check mark, it basically it's a big loop and it jumps right back to the top and it requests a new audio captcha and it goes through the whole process again. So that's kind of how that all works and I just always wanted to know that system. So really, it's a good example of using a bunch of existing libraries, other people's APIs, like the power of like just mass distributed free platforms to accomplish a really cool goal. And I have 10 seconds left, so. Thank you. Yeah, their, their paper actually explains how it, they made it more difficult. They also, they threw in letters as well, and they added like louder background noise to make it harder for a machine to distinguish when it's a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, their, their bit in the paper didn't say that, but maybe they've also added that in the meantime. I don't know. Are you guys right. doing your big story, or what's going on? Yes, That's the discussion piece. Is that in the notes? Uh, that should be the slides. Yeah, the slides. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So you want to just fire that back up for you? Oh, no. <laughs> Live editing. Yeah, we'll do that next time. What's that? We'll just do that next time. Uh, sorry. Okay, cool. Hmm? You got time. Okay, we got time. Well, don't touch the stream. Just don't touch the stream, right? Yeah. Oh, you have to do it No, no, I just have some stuff. Okay. All right. Um, so basically, for for your feature story, um, so just out of just an open, uh, you want to start that, start off? Sure, sure, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah. So uh, by the way, this is the feature story segment. If you haven't done this before, I know there's a whole bunch of first years in the room. Um, the whole goal is that you're participating. Right? So instead of listening, I hope that you're talking more than me right now. Okay. Um, so please help me out. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, um, we okay. want to hear your opinions. Yes, we would so. love to hear your opinions. Um, so my first question to you, uh, before we actually delve into the story, is um, has anyone here, does anyone here know anyone who's like been targeted by ransomware? Yeah. yeah. Any calls? Uh, company last year. Yeah. Um, they went into work one morning and then uh, like half an hour after meeting, like the clock was starting up. Uh, Everyone's computers like at the same time, got like this thing on the screen. Everyone's been locked out, and wow. long story short, it was fifteen thousand dollars in Bitcoin to a to a thing address. They called in a bunch of security people. They called in like you know authorities, mm -hmm. and literally every single person was like, "There's nothing we can do. We don't have a meeting. You're uh, locked out." Yeah. And the IT guy in like in panic while trying to recover the stuff deleted some of the backups they had. And, like oh, it was a huge new It was huge. Oh, no. it was terrible. Yeah. 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 And were they and were they insured? Pardon me? Were they insured? Do you know? I don't know the, the details, but they got you okay. know. Okay. But it cost yeah. it cost well, a you know huge. What? No, I do. They weren't insured for oh. cyber stuff because they mm -hmm. didn't think it was a possibility. And as soon as that happened, yep. they got a whole yep. new IT thing. They like got a backups in the cloud, hard backups. Like they went all out. Yeah. Like yep. yep. You have to learn from experience, right? Uh, that's usually when you start backing up. Anyone else? We saw some hands up. Yeah. My honey pot. <laughs> oh boy. So like no data was lost, but still no, like kind of sucked. Oh. Oh, that's 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 oh okay, okay. <laughs> so you kind of wish that you had a backup? <laughs> okay, okay. Close enough. How about anyone else? Any like aunts and uncles, maybe? Yeah? I mean, the company I work for specializes in dealing with ransomware. Cool. Oh, so tell okay. us about it. So you, I'm sure you'll have stuff to say. Uh, anyone else? We got a hand in the back? Yeah. The place that I worked at over the summer was hacked before I started working there. And then basically, the basis we just had like a really cool like security breach that like Those are becoming a lot more common yeah. nowadays. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. then ransom so, for, for so it seems like the moral is a lot of, based on your experiences, before a ransomware, you guys, no one assumes that they would get hit with ransomware, right? And then once you do, like it, the whole situation turns around and that's when you guys start preparing, right? So I um, think that's... Yeah, uh, yeah what's, what's interesting? Anything? Yeah, I mean, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. Everything that uh, you've all said is that, um, well, everybody here has actually mentioned a small business and not a relative. Is there a relative? Do you guys know of a relative, for example, or a friend? That's in You're hoping for a personal story, but you never know what you get during these not, segments. Well, no, I mean, not necessarily. <laughs> it has to do with the odds of, yeah. Kurt is a hero. Kurt yeah, is a hero. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right in time. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Would you consider Syscaying uh, ransomware? It's kind of the same premise, right? Sure. You ask for a ransom to yeah. get on sure. Syscaying. Right? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I did that by accident. Uh, that was like <laughs> when you mentioned before the call of the 1 800 number, I had a problem with my old laptop. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get the fan to cool off, so I called them and then they told me, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to connect through speak to your computer and find out <laughs> it's, a, it's a software issue we'll fix it but you gotta wire me seventy dollars from your credit card and i'll fix your fan problem to which it just like, up i don't yeah, think they yeah. call the number again it turns out that somehow they just really I they intercepted it i actually got a win on my hp person and they ended up telling me yeah it's a hardware problem just ship it over we'll wow. It. wow wow that's nuts yeah so you never know like even even like us being security professionals right like you never know who gets hit um, so basically, the story that we decided to cover is about ransomware. So basically, uh, the gist of it is, is Mercury Insurance uh, started becoming uh, started offering ransomware insurance to consumers. Businesses have had this opportunity to buy cyber insurance for a long time, um, and it's starting to become a lot more traction uh, in the industry. And basically, it's a flat fee. You get thirty dollars. Uh, you pay thirty dollars a year, and it's in addition to your home, car insurance, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And basically, if you get hit with ransomware, you get a you you can claim up to 500k of uh, damages. And also, they provide some helpful services like uh, you can receive professional assistance uh, from cybersecurity experts. So it seems like by the tone, they're gonna try to like fix the ransomware because there have been situations where ransomware has been written poorly. The crypto like the implementation has been wrong or something, and so they can actually. Um, uh, brute for like decrypt the device uh, even though the malware the ransomware says it can um, and so yeah yeah and I, I guess oh sorry yeah Clint. well I was gonna say like the big question is why offer a reaction when you can offer prevention that's a good point it's because, because <laughs> here I'll tell you why it's because it is easier to build somebody the whole way to fix a problem that might happen than give them one time charge for a solution they'll give them yeah yeah that's that, our strategy right that here. is a great segue into <laughs> do we actually need this right yeah. um so you know as as consumers i want to think of your daily lives the people that you know your relatives your friends all of that and i want you to kind of think about this from three different angles right um who is the target market for this kind of insurance um what are actually, are there any alternatives to just buying insurance, right? And Clinton actually just alluded to this. And then the third thing is that what are actually the odds of getting infected, right? So um, just to kind of ask you a question, it, it, has anyone in this room, if you don't mind sharing, been targeted with ransomware and gone infected with ransomware? No. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> but you were asking for it too. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, you know, thinking about this, who do you think this is meant to, to cover? It will be like small businesses and honestly speaking, well, it's, it's a consumer, it's a yeah. consumer product, yeah. right? Yeah, but it won't, it won't be affected big companies, for example, somebody like uh, Best Buy, Walmart, companies that have an entire IR team mm-hmm. or an entire legal team or somebody behind it who can say, okay, you know what, everything gets 
especially big businesses who basically make all the computer VMs. Like, oh, we can go rents for this thing. Yep. Okay, so you think Best Buy might start selling something like that? Try sell, no, 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 selling no, no, it? No, like the big companies, for example, Home Depot. Is oh, yeah. They, all their machines are VMs. So yeah. If Home Depot gets infected by something, all what they do is literally turn it off and turn them all off, turn them all back up again. Mm -hmm. It never happens. Mm -hmm. It happens okay. for nine companies. Yeah. Okay. Actually, in terms of the enterprise, uh, uh, was it, sorry, enterprise insurance for against ransomware, actually, companies are actually paying for this. So. Yeah, because it's yeah. still cheaper yeah. than having to have your own internal IR team or your company at all times paying for saying waiting for something to happen. Yeah, yeah. Like we'll, get, we'll, get to we'll get to business. We'll get to business in a second. Oh, yeah. so we're, we're, but yeah, just to consumers, consumers what do you guys think about on a like companies and stuff that don't have like this consumer level? This is consumer level. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. just just to keep the discussion kind of on target, the, this company's providing consumer level insurance. So to you and me, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, who do you think they're trying to target with this kind of product? I think it goes both ways. One, it could be people that you know are educated in the matter, but also have a lot to lose. Or it could just be like you know you're in a house, you got young kids, you're maybe you got a grandma that you want to help out, make sure she doesn't do anything funny, you know. So mm -hmm. either you know what you're doing, but you also you know have some important stuff, or you have no idea what you're doing. You got young kids, you have you know some other people. Yeah, that don't exactly. Know what uh, that's that's actually exactly the, the answer that I was looking for, right? So um, you know, not not, not to be ageist, and I'm not saying you know every old person is is bad with computers or anything like that, right? But I, I used to work at Best Buy, and at Best Buy, you know, I had people come in who don't really know what Word is. You know, they have no idea how to even begin going about doing a backup. And then I've also had my brother who has been fooled by like this little game where. Um, it's you know it's somehow he somehow connected it to my dad's credit card and then he started just clicking things away and all of a sudden every with every click it's charging the credit card right so malicious stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamie, you had a comment? The, the definition of this is you know like so often specifically on like targeted marketing I call it headliners people who read the headlines and security topics but don't read the rest of the article saying oh yeah this is the specifics of it it's like oh yeah. Uh, the NHS got infected by ransomware and so many billions of dollars lost. And people start being a little bit like fear mongered into mm -hmm. buying something like this. It's like, oh, wait, I need this. It'll prevent me from getting this happen. Or. Yeah, and th that's a great point. There's always perverse incentives when money in is involved. But, I mean, I don't want to like decry insurance altogether just because insurance does have a legitimate use case. There's a reason why we have insurance. Um, out there for a whole variety of products, right? Mm -hmm. um, so basically, like what I'm hearing is is that you know this might make sense for some people, but not others, right? So it might be something that's kind of in their tool, uh, that something to add to their toolkit when they you know fight cybercrime and, and, and all that, right? Um, what about like alternatives? Like, let's say you know you're going to tell uh, your relative you're not going to you're not allowed to buy this insurance, right? What could you tell them? What could you do? Yeah. Right, that's a general question. What exactly is the insuring? Uh, sure, yeah, it's insuring a ransomware. Um, so, but and- Is it insuring yeah. the information that you lost? Is it insuring the damages? Not, not the information lost. What the ransom actually amount is? Right, so it's up to 50K, and that includes any cost to like, an attempt to recover the data, or to actually pay the ransom. If that mm -hmm. comes yeah. Back. yeah. yeah. So it, also, it also depends on which plan you get. If, you know, if the device cannot be recovered, they'll insure the device itself. Mm -hmm. So if your computer has to be thrown out and smashed with a hammer, they'll basically give you the money to buy it. Yep. yep. Kind of like the same thing goes for like fire insurance or like mm -hmm. water. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that's what it's being bundled with. Yeah. yeah. And um, with like average ransom, like how much they're ransoming and how much it would cost to recover the data, is this like a good amount? Um, that's a great question that we're going to discuss. So, so um, I mean, sure. I mean, I'll jump to that since since you mentioned it. So, like, what are what are you know the odds? Do you think of actually getting affected with ransomware? Uh, I mean, first of all, going from my own honey pot, we'll just cover your five IP addresses, and all of them are residential IP addresses. Right. Of all five of them, four of them have been probed by a ransom, a known ransomware system um, that was in a home in the mafia. That one specifically pings specific IP address ranges that are known to be residential. 
very high, at least to be pro-fire right. ransomware, not necessarily affected by right. ransomware. Okay. What does everyone else think? Probably pretty low. Well. To well. as like uh, as like just regular people, I think the where the money is going to be is going to be getting businesses, you know, trying to get like a lot of money back versus one here or there. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, um, to kind of give you for business, the picture is like very very clear, right? Forty-seven percent of businesses will face a ransomware attack every year. Um, it's an $8, dollar, $8 billion dollar business, so the, whoever is deploying the ransomware is actually making that money. And then over 40% actually end up paying the ransom, which is about 40, or, Sorry, it's like about 40% of about 47, or 40% of the 1%, right? Like, is it only 7% of the business? To no, it'd be 40% of the people that got hit with ransomware oh, would yeah. pay. Yeah, yeah. Pay yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the average amount that a ransom is to get paid? Like, when my dad's company did the thing, it was like the current value of Bitcoin or whatever, it came into like, 14 change, almost 15k. Is like, is yeah. that a high amount? Is that a low amount? What's the? No, that's a great question. So uh, it's about 2k for like your average like small business. Yeah, that's and a big then, company though. It's okay. Not like they if, make it. So if it's a big organization, money. I don't know, right? I mean, they might be asking for like a ton of money. Yeah. A lot of it depends on if they know what they care about. If that's they don't know what they because like Jamie was saying, a lot of it's automated. Mm -hmm. So if they think that they've just found some like home or a small business, they can be talked down. Because you can, you know, say, oh no, we don't have that much money. We're small, so they'll negotiate. <laughs> as, and as long as you don't let them know how bad it is and how big your work is, um, you can really reduce. Them. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, is there any information on how often paying doesn't get you the key? How often paying doesn't get you the key? I haven't done any research so, on that, but that's a really good was, question. Um, a couple of years ago, showed that it was really low. Yeah. Because basically the. The gangs that operate that shut those people down really quickly because if that became common, nobody would pay ransoms, and then those big organized crime gangs would get money. Mm -hmm. right, so mm -hmm. they will target. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so you know go, going back to sort of so that's that's like the business side, right? But then if you actually go to the consumer side, like there are barely any numbers. Like I kid you not, I've spent two days trying to find like information. And the best kind of guess that I got was that three to ten percent of consumers will be infected with malware, not necessarily ransomware, um, over uh, their lifetime. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, or sorry, that is actually per year. I think. I think that's per year. Yeah. Um, but there's like no information on doing the ransomware loan. So anyway. Uh, I thought that I would do like a quick calculation, right? So let's assume the higher end, like 10% of all people will be hit by malware. And let's say that 25% of those malware samples are actually ransomware, right? Um, and the average payout for a consumer, I did find this somehow, uh, is that it's around $752,000. So you're looking at like an expected, you're expected to pay about $18 to $50 per year, which is, you know, falls within that range around the $30 per year, right? So insurance, generally speaking, like, at least I think so, like how you should approach it in life, is it's just a numbers thing, right? What is the risk? And given the risk, should I actually um, be insured, right? Should I, should I buy this for myself? Yep. Um, there's just one last thing that I want to get to because it is Cybersecurity Awareness um, Month this month, I believe, October, right? Nick? Yes. Yeah, confirmation. Yes. Not. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so the interesting thing is that this insurance company doesn't include things like identity theft. And identity theft is like a huge problem, right? So if you just look at like some of the numbers here, you know, 110 million people were notified of a data breach last year. Um, and like that's crazy. That's thirty-two percent of the U.S. population. Um, now we don't know like how many people actually had their like SIN number stolen or something like that. Um, but we do know that sixteen point seven million, right, were victims of identity fraud, and in that twenty-five percent of those cases, money was lost. And the average amount that they lose is about eighteen hundred dollars. But you have to understand that if your information's out there, that eighteen hundred dollars is probably going to happen again and again and again. It, it absolutely destroys your life, right? For your identity being stolen. Um, and the interesting thing is that you don't see a lot of, uh, you know, identity theft insurance. But now we're seeing ransomware insurance because ransomware, you know, 
probably the odds of a consumer getting targeted are very low, but identity theft is actually quite high. And 16.7 million, I think that puts us about at about 5% uh, of the people in this room will, will get hit. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, I made a very financial argument, but I want you to kind of think about it in the non-financial sense, and this is what Adam will be talking to. So, do you guys think that there could be, so as we've seen, like businesses have been hit with ransomware a lot and uh, the reasoning behind it is because it's more, mu you'll get a larger payout with, a, with less people that you have to target. Whereas with consumers, you would have to hit a lot of people to get the same amount of money because consumers don't have, like uh, won't be paying thousands upon thousands of dollars to decrypt one computer, right? If, if you hit a business uh, a server, they may be willing to pay like thousands of dollars for you to unlock it. So uh, with that in mind, ransomware has been largely tar targeting businesses. So do you guys think that uh, since if consumers start becoming insured and as we saw like uh, 50K uh, to their insurance will cover you to pay for ransomware, do you guys think that that would actually change the equation? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because uh, sure. if people are insured for you know ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars or fifty thousand dollars in this case, then mm -hmm. we as the potential hacker are like, okay, well, how many insurance companies are going to yeah. pay? Yeah. So yeah. That are, it's going to be their first question when you call them to pay the ransom. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have credit insurance? <laughs> <laughs> then they'll write in the contract. It's like when you get abducted, do you have insurance? You can't say no. Yes. Go ahead, Jimmy. I'd love to see whether or not this becomes the tornado insurance problem. Okay. Or for those who don't know, tornado insurance or hurricane insurance is a rampant scam in Florida where people say, like, oh, yeah, you're insured for a hurricane damage and like wind damage and all that. What's the like largest factor of a hurricane? Rain. So what happens during hurricanes is they flood, and they flood a house, and your insurance company comes and like, oh yeah, uh, that's all flood damage, we're not covering that. And that's a huge problem. I'd be really curious to see if this is like, oh yeah, the initial point of compromise is not not um, like malware, like ransomware, yeah. or crypto virus. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, you just downloaded something sketchy off of like KBB, and like you're done. We're not yeah. covering that. I'd be really curious to see if that's going to build. That's actually a good point. I haven't thought of it that way. Go ahead. Actually, to complement on your point, uh, there have been cases already in the U.S. of companies going to claim the insurance for the uh, for ransomware, and there is a clause on the insurance that says that we are not allowed, we are not legally allowed to pay you for anything, and it covers most insurances if it is caused by what's considered an act. Oh yeah. So, so uh, ransomware. If they deem that the ransomware was originated by any group in any country in the U.S., of course they right. In the U.S., the cases were found that most of the ransomware was made by Russian groups. So the insurance will simply tell you, "This is from Russia. It's considered an act of war. Mm -hmm. I don't have to pay you anything. Would you still require to make me the payments, or I will insure you?" You have to wait until you get hacked by a Canadian. Then he applies for insurance, but if you get attacked, if you get ransomware from anywhere in any country that's in a kind of war or in a state of conflict, they legally don't have to give you anything mm -hmm. because that's it's being, an act of war. That's being fought right now. Exactly. Yeah. The provider would need to prove that it's from Russia and the attribution is hard. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. That, that's, that's how they're starting the first layer. Kind of like when you get fire insurance and then they tell you, okay, we're going to check if it was your dog who peed on the outlet <laughs> or if you, you forgot to turn your light yeah. off and then you have to put yeah. light on top of it. Mm -hmm. That's basically the first thing they tell you is we gotta make sure it's not the Russians. In the meantime, we're not paying you. Have fun. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. And then what are you gonna do in that situation? Um, any any other comments? Do you guys do you guys see any other side effects? Like right right now, the deal seems pretty pretty good, right? You yeah, pay through. Absolutely, we're we're incentivizing the funding of organized crime. Okay, so it's more of like moral issue then about not paying. So it's encouraging, like, op but I mean, like, many like companies have been paying ransomware, right? Yeah. And not only and companies. The, it's one of those things, like the advice from you know for the longest time, for years, from the FBI and stuff was, don't fund organized crime. But then, under the hood, they were like, yeah, if you need your data that bad to the continued operation mm -hmm. of your business, pay your ransom. But yep. on the on the front, it clearly says, no, you can't do this because yep. 
really, if we get facts about it, it's just going to happen even more, and you're continuing to put money into these pockets. So. Absolutely. And right now, right? So, yeah, exactly. Um, and right now, we're not being targeted, right? Because we, we're not paying as much as businesses, right? Um, there is also uh, kind of just an, like question. Do you guys think that there's a difference between businesses getting cyber insurance and why consumers might? Do you guys see a difference? Like why, why it makes sense for one, not the other? Go ahead. I wouldn't underestimate how much people are willing to pay for, for experience, right? Like, you're like graphic designer, something you have all the stuff that you've been making, or like you're a musician, you have all the songs that you've ever made. Yeah. How many hours make like putting your you know blood, sweat, and tears into it? Now you lost it all. Mm -hmm. That could be worth a lot of money to somebody mm -hmm. if you're not backed up your stuff. Which and, and that's a counter argument against that financial yeah. argument that I was making. Yeah. You just think in the numbers maybe it doesn't make sense, but from a sentimental yeah. perspective, it might. Not. Mm -hmm. Hey, go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Like if they're known that they got hit by this attack and like all of their like they lost a bunch of their stuff, then like especially companies that if their business is kind of using people's information and like and their customers that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. then like people are gonna be like, Oh, well they just got hit by an attack the other day. I'm not gonna think about this itself, so I'm mm -hmm. not gonna I'm gonna think about this itself mm -hmm. or I'm not gonna sign off. But insurance doesn't stop the attack. It just uh, like deflects who has to foot the bill. Right? Um, and, and you, uh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Pardon? Like, it can also help fix the problem faster. If once what? Once the deed is done. Once the, the, once the ransomware has been executed, mm -hmm. if the company doesn't have the money to start their contingency plan yep. and have a fix, mm -hmm. Okay. The insurance will give them that financial aid in order to build the business back up quicker. So okay. So you're saying, okay. Yeah. The two things I just realized. One is, there's, remember reading online a while ago that companies that are hit by ransomware fold within like two years. Or, or some, oh, some yeah. major yeah. cyber attacks. Yeah. 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 yeah not yeah. necessarily yeah. ransomware. The other question I'm realizing is, specifically for like Nick or anyone on that end, during like the end stage of like, yep, yeah, here's what happened, here's your final representation. Did you ever propose that you could have gotten insurance for this? Um, normally if you're a kind of big company, obviously kind of big thing, but um, normally that's the question that the IR team asks the client first um, before you get hired. Do you have, have breach insurance? Because if so, we're probably gonna be contracted through your insurer or through your law firm who's probably gonna ask you those questions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Did we ever mention it as a remediation step? Um, it wasn't really a thing when I was still doing it. So, no. I mean, I mentioned to people the fact that it exists, but never as a like, suggested remediation alternative. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and in my case, like, most of the clients we have, we hear about them through insurance. Like, that's, that's how they get our number, basically. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it's all through insurance. <laughs> Because if a business, right, like uh, they they have to pay for someone else to do it, right? Like either way, e either an employee or uh, or they have to contract it out because they might not have the talent uh, internally to have an IR team. So it's a totally different discussion. Another thing that I was thinking of is um, is I think that there is a bit of a difference between consumers and and businesses in how in why they buy insurance. Businesses are all about um, their, uh, especially public companies, they're all about their shareholders and uh, what, what impacts, impacts their uh, share price. So if, for example, um, a business got hit with, uh, with, with ransomware or any kind of malware, they have to spend a lot of money to remediate it. 
And so that will hit their financial numbers and that will be a big hit to them. And that instability is something that like we've seen, like for example, Equifax, like it, it tanked their, their share price, right? And, and like see like the, the senior leaders like knew that they were gonna lose a ton of money as well, right? Personally as well, it was gonna affect them personally and also their shareholders that they're accountable to. And shareholders can fire CEOs, right? It's that, it's that power that uh, they have. So um, I think that uh, businesses, they usually will have a lot of cash flow. They have a lot of cash reserves. So paying that ransomware um, is not that problem, uh, that big of a problem. Like uh, for example, Facebook, like, like if they get hit with like GDPR, it's like max they'll be hit with is like 3%, which is like a couple like million or maybe like in a billions. But like, that's like 3% of their like, like re revenue, right? That's like, you know. Um, but so for businesses, if they pay insurance, then they get a stable kind of uh, expense, but it's not never an influx. So they don't get to see that hit on their fi on their financials. Whereas with consumers, um, they get insurance to be able to afford a sudden large payout because they wouldn't have the money otherwise. Like for example, if you think of car insurance, I don't have like you know like. 30 grand sitting there in case I like hit like a BMW or something, right? Like I, that's why I have insurance to hopefully, like after a long battle in court, probably they would pay, right? So I think that that fundamental difference, um, that fundamental difference is why I'm kind of leaning towards like consumer, like kind of looking at this and not being as like th enthusiastic about it because it shifts that, equ it, it only makes us more of a target. Um, whereas with businesses, they're already a target anyways. They have the money to burn. So, I don't know. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah? I still, I still think that, again, and this is what happens when you go to an insurance company, because I had to do it when I moved to my place, right? Okay. I was sitting down and he was telling me, you need this, you need this, here's, you need this. Yeah. Pet insurance, fire insurance, flood insurance, although I did look up for <laughs> They still want to shove insurance in there. Yeah. And like what Nick mentioned before, right? If you start offering people, hey, we're going to give you insurance for ransomware, all of that's going to do is going to make it go from the company sector to the consumer sector because mm -hmm. it's like that. It's like, oh, you're insured for, we know you're going to be insured for $20,000 because, well, we're going to be talking to these insurance people. Some people just walk in there and out. Mm -hmm. So they know, okay, if I hit you for $15,000, $19,999, you know you're insured. You're going to pay it right away. Would it, be, it will be easier if we just find a way to just teach people, tell people, hey, you know what, instead of having to spend, which of course nobody's going to like it, instead of paying all this money for insurance company, mm -hmm. it's a dip. Mm -hmm. Here's like a dummy sky to backing up your yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it, you know, like something like Carbonite, which has insurance already provided because the company says, well, we protect everything you're shopping here. You have 10 terabytes of information. Put your family pictures, put your dog pictures, put your, I don't know, clown pictures from college. Oh Show boy. them all in here. <laughs> if we get hit, mm -hmm. we have backup, and we are insured already. So all you're doing is you're paying me half of what you would pay for insurance. Yeah. Just to have cloud mm -hmm. backup with insurance that we will have anyways, or just do... Like we do. I go yep. home, plug in an external hard drive, install my machine. My mm -hmm. machine gives me a pop up every once in a while saying, hey, you're running out of space. You want to just grab all your data, shove it in here, empty it out, continue filming with data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to, you know, just, just to talk about that a little bit. I mean, I, I, see, I see where you're coming from, but at the same time, I think you're only looking at it from like one angle. And you're looking at it from your personal perspective where um, you're like an IT person, right? And you know exactly what to do and you know how to back up your data, right? Um, so just to do kind of a recap, because uh, you know, I don't want this to become like insurance is bad, right? No one should ever buy insurance, right? Um, you know, in my opinion, right, one is that you have to look at the target market. You know, it's a tool, a tool that you can use. Does it make sense for you, right? Does it make sense? It might make sense for like my grandparents. Hell, it probably does make sense for my grandparents, right? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense with, for a family with kids who are not really aware of how to you know, navigate an online environment? It mm -hmm. might actually make sense for them, right? Um, however, if you look at it from the financial side, um, it's not very clear, right? Is this actually worth it? Because the odds of actually getting ransomware are actually pretty low. 
But if we start offering the cyber insurance, then now we might actually be increasing the odds of that mm -hmm. happening, right? Yeah. So, and at the same time, you know, you mentioned uh, alternatives, right? Um, this is thirty dollars for the whole year. If I want to buy any backup software, and if I remember correctly from Best Buy, it's going to cost you like a good seventy to one hundred and twenty dollars per year. So you would actually be paying um, more to do that. Right? Mm -hmm. So. Again, not to say that insurance is bad, but it, th that decision has to be personal, and that decision has to be made, um, you know, where am I in my life? Um, what are the odds of this happening to me? Um, how much do I care about, you know, stuff like family photos and stuff like that? Um, or do I care more about that financial argument? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so I and know, yeah. I mean, more, more and more of our lives are, are uh, on the digital side, right? So we already have physical insurance, right? That covers like physical uh, objects and ourselves Like we have life insurance, like some people have life insurance, right? So, I mean, it, it's an interesting step, like bring this to consumers and saying, hey, like why not insure your, your digital footprint as well, right? I mean, it's gonna be interesting, right? Like seeing what, what that turns out to be. I mean, like cyber crime is only increasing, right? Breaches are, it's only, becoming like like more and more widespread right more and more organized um, like so yeah it'll, it'll be interesting do you would you would any of you guys like be interested in something like this like I know we're all broke students but like when you're <laughs> <laughs> starting to sound like a sales pitch yeah, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to present both sides yeah, yeah. So but I, I, hope, I hope we're doing that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but would any would anyone be interested for or for example come home and be like hey mom dad I have something something really cool that you could spend money on. <laughs> yeah. Considering my parents won't pay six bucks a month for backblades, I would definitely say yeah, pay thirty bucks a year for this. Yeah. Because you, like the, the argument for my point on backblades is that they've had four major data loss incidents in the last two years. Uh, all four of them are revolving around my dad kicking a laptop off the table because he plugged in something and kicked it. Oh. But, <laughs> Yeah. So you because it's familiar, right? Like insurance, like people are familiar with, like are used to paying in uh, like insurance, right? Like it's like oh, like insurance for another thing. Yeah, I, I guess I'll pay it, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right. That's actually. I get a lot of pushback. Like people are gonna be saying, "Let Barry pay Trend Micro or whoever X number of dollars a year for my antivirus. Why isn't my antivirus stopping this?" It's probably in a AV's best interest to actually like absorb a service like this, tack on a few bucks, and kind of if they're really good behind the scenes, they could probably actually intercept the the like malware or the ransom request and actually like handle that them themselves like. And facilitate it without the end user ever even knowing. That's actually an interesting, wow. a really good that's idea. Huge. That'd yeah, that'd be a really cool idea. Is anybody going to pick that up as their capstone project? Yeah, <laughs> 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 Just watch pop up windows for the word Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, like the caps are better. Yeah, yeah. So I'll like go home and just like look at sketchy websites then for, <laughs> for science. Yeah, go ahead, Glinton. You want to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's another thing too, right? Well, right because it's new, right? It's it's I guess it's kinda like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's kinda like Netflix back in the day. It was like awesome, like you could sign up like you know, like have a thirty dollar like a thirty person family all paying like six bucks. And then like now they're cr they're clamping down on that. Hmm? I know back in the day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much. I, I know you probably all have something more to say, but it was a, it was a really good discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for participating. Um, yeah. So we're gonna do like a five-minute break, and then we'll have uh, Matt do his talk on an intro to blue teaming.
Yep. Thank you guys for participating. Do I have anything incriminating on here? Mm. I mean, we can, you know, we always give the speakers an option about how to turn it on. I mean, YOLO, let's do it. Let's do it live. Um, I mean, you can always just have it on this. Because that's what's showing on the stream. Yeah. So if you want, you can just leave it to it. Yeah, we'll keep that for you. Oh, I think eventually it's going to want a signal, otherwise the stream's going to shut down. Actually, yeah. Uh, you probably should come here. What'd you do? Oh, it's duplicate. I hate when this happens. Cool. So I'll be streaming that screen. I hope so too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's grabbing. Yeah. It's whatever's coming out of your machine. That's what's grabbing. So if you, so if you ever want to know what's going on, basically what people do is you do that rather than watch the and say you're going to have to like join that as part of the guys. So when do we start? Whenever we start. Yeah, a couple of I'm not selling anything. I'm just saying the good and bad, you know? Yeah, red team is flashy, but maybe you just want a nice simple life, you know? Okay, maybe you don't want to do that. Okay. Our team has been like struggling to hire like people that actually can work. Actually can work? Like on our team? Because we built rules, right? Yeah. So it's like anyone who does who does apply is like does an ongoing work. I'm kind of stuck on that screen. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Just give it, it's like behind my usually more. Yeah, but it's been on that for like a couple minutes. I know, who's testing? Last time I did a talk, it was like Ken, you remember? Well, there's one person watching. Maybe we just don't stream. It's too late. Your boss, we're going to send this to your boss. You just sent to my boss all the incriminating information I put on this slide? Yeah. Oh, I 
say it's frozen because that, that would have been adamant. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. If I can do it live. Yeah, there's one. I'll just start talking. Yeah. I'll see if I can troubleshoot this while you're doing stuff. Yeah. And then we'll write that. Kills the whole thing. I mean, we can just take this and I'll take this. It's okay. Can you come to this? Um, let, let's see if we can fix well, it. Well, yeah, you guys start talking. This, this yeah. might take a while. Right, as much information as I can. I vastly underestimate the amount of information you could pack into a presentation about blue teaming, so we'll try our best. So about me. So I'm a recent graduate. I graduated at the same time as the other people. I'm a security analyst at Terranet. So Terranet is a company that manages the electronic land registration system, which is if you buy a house, you do land title transfers, you go through our system. So we have this huge trove of information which is valuable to people. So my job is to protect that information. Now, that's my Twitter handle, You'll probably see it like the second time now, and that's my dog. And I also play a bunch of Commander. I, this guy should play as well, but he's, he's a radical extremist. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit of history. So imagine before the year 2000, is a world without cyber. So no buzzwords, just you know, people working day-to-day -day jobs, not working stuff. So sysadmins did everything. So they set up all the like you know security. They probably learned from like you know textbooks or magazines about whatever to do to protect their systems. And basically, they just protected their application. So they would do stuff like oh, ensure they would do their security job, and then they would do application support. Like oh, make sure the application doesn't go down. Make sure you know manage this specific application. So they were their own team, but they did security on the side, and they got pretty much little to no funding. So you don't get like, you know, dedicated resources from the CEO to improve your funding. And this is kind of what happens to the CEO after an instance. <laughs> so blue teams in the modern context. So these are responsibilities that you would get in a modern environment. You do governance and policy, which is designing the rules for the company. You'd be auditing security controls, making sure that our investments are actually doing something. Access control, making sure people have only access to things that they should have and instant response. So what happens when the controls fail and we need to figure out how it happened and what we can do to stop it? And other stuff, you know. So a big rule to note is that the bigger the organization, the more role specialization you have to do. So if you're working at a company like you know RBC, you're probably gonna be doing one very specific task for their job. That's why they hired you. But if you're working for a smaller organization, your roles will probably be more diverse. So you'll probably be doing a little bit of everything as part of your job instruction. So let's go over organizational structures because that's what we came here for. So organizational structures. So imagine this diagram for less than 100 employees. It's probably just going to be like one to three IT guys with a background in security, and they all report to the business owner. You know, you just have that guy, and you're the security guy. You just have to do everything for the company. It's one guy doing everything. Increases. So you will have one guy. Usually, your job title will be actually security specialist because that indicates. Well, I guess that was the terminology back then for a guy who does basically anything to do 